tonight on It's a Miracle. Experience the terror of being trapped in the path of a tornado. I was holding Graham and I was hanging on as tight as I could, but yet Graham was being lifted up in the air and I heard the voice say, hang on to the baby. Plus, two strangers meet on a plane. Are you a doctor? Um, no. And I told him the story and why I was flying to, to be with Debbie. And he says, well, I'm going to see my sister too, but for a very different reason. I said, yeah, I'm going to uh, Paducah, Kentucky, because my nephew just accidentally shot himself. Their unlikely meeting would be the beginning of a miracle. Also, a sudden storm at sea and a family pet is thrown overboard. All I thought is the chances of finding him would be very hard. I was just devastated. These stories and more on this edition of It's a Miracle. And now from PAX TV Studio 611, your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. You're about to take an emotional roller coaster ride, reliving moments in some very special people's lives that can only be described in emotional terms. Devastating, heart-wrenching, frightening, yet ultimately joyous, exhilarating, and miraculous. We begin in Gainesville, Georgia, March 1998, tornado season. On the morning of March 20th, 1998, Hall County, Georgia firefighter Wayne Holcomb was fast asleep when an emergency call came in. A local grade school had just been hit by a tornado. When the call came in that it was a tornado touchdown, to possible injuries, a lot of things go through your mind. The possibility of teachers getting there early, children getting there, parents dropping them off. I didn't know what kind of injuries we would have there. As the firemen rushed to leave, they encountered a major problem. The storm suddenly knocked out the electricity, and the doors to the firehouse refused to open. All except one. I pushed the button, and the door went up. Straight, get the ladder. Door won't work. I did not manually unlock the door, nor did anybody else lift the door. It went up on its own. Unaware of the other's dilemma, Wayne headed toward the disaster area alone. I kept looking in the mirror to see where the engine and the ambulance was, and I didn't see it. Usually, we're in sight of one another all the way to the call. Wayne didn't know it, but he was heading straight into the path of the tornado. All of a sudden, it began to rain harder than I've ever seen it. It was almost like somebody pouring buckets tubs, barrels, whatever, of water just directly on you. The rain was so hard you couldn't see anything in front of you. The windshield wipers were on full blast. They were going just as hard as they could go. And it was like I didn't have windshield wipers. In another part of town, Michelle Roper was about to wake her daughters for school when she noticed something strange. I looked out my window and the the whole sky was washed in ammonia yellow. I heard a voice tell me, it's a tornado, get the girls now. Then Michelle heard a terrifying sound. A roar. It was like a freight train coming in our backyard. I ran to my daughter's room and it sounded like the train was about to crash into the house. With just moments to spare, Michelle pushed her children into a small, windowless bathroom. Perhaps they'd be safe there. I remember just standing there for just like a split second, thinking, what do we do next? And that's when it hit the house. 
Wayne Holcomb was only a mile and a half from the fire station when he, too, was overtaken by the storm. Debris started hitting my truck, pieces of trees, limbs. Next thing I know, my truck was sitting sideways in the road. I can't explain how scared I was at that time. Back at the Roper's home, the tornado was ripping through the house with an incredible force. I could feel just all kinds of stuff hitting my back and my head, and just all over. I remember wondering what was going on. It was this a nightmare? Was it really happening? I was holding Graham, and I was hanging on as tight as I could. I felt like something was holding me down. But yet Graham was being lifted up in the air, and I was hanging on to him. I heard the boy say, hang on to the baby. And I did with every ounce of strength that I had. I did not close my eyes. If this was going to be my last few seconds on Earth, I wanted to see what was happening to me. Terrifying conclusion when It's a Miracle continues. Next, the Roper family's home takes a direct hit from the tornado. All of a sudden, everything just exploded. It was there one second, and the next second it wasn't. On the morning of March 20th, 1998, a tornado struck Hall County, Georgia, and Michelle Roper and her children were trapped in its path. As they huddled together in a small bathroom, the fury of the storm ripped away sections of their home as the power of the tornado's winds lifted them off the floor. And then, total disaster struck. All of a sudden, everything just exploded. It was there one second, and the next second it wasn't. One second we were in the, the shrill, the roars, the shrieks, and then it was silence. As suddenly as it had appeared, the tornado was gone. At that same moment, Wayne Holcomb finally realized how close his life had come to ending. I could see devastation and destruction everywhere. Houses totally destroyed, trees down, power lines down, vehicles overturned, roofs gone off of some houses. Nothing was in place. Nothing is where it should have been. The only thing left of the Roper home was a tiny patch of linoleum where they'd huddled together. I looked over at my daughters and they were covered in debris. Summer had blood on her, but they were alive. And I was still holding Graham and then I looked down and he was just covered in blood, and he had a huge gaping hole in his head. You've got to get help with your brother now. Hurry. And that same boy said, go down the road. It was like walking through a war zone. It just did not seem real. I kept thinking, I'm going to wake up, and this is just a really bad dream. And then, as if it had been miraculously blown there by the storm, Michelle spotted Wayne's fire truck. They were running toward me, and I could tell at that time the baby was bleeding pretty bad. The baby's arms were limp. He was like laying a dish rag over your arms. To me, he was dead. I couldn't get any uh, vital signs from him. I put my face down, could not feel any air moving through him. There was no movement, and I just wanted my baby whole and healthy again. She was hollering, what can she do? And uh, I just told her to pray. I knew that it would take more than what I could do to help that child. I did not want to tell her that the baby 
may be dead. I did not want to have to look at that mother in the eyes and say, there's nothing I can do. Why don't y'all go get in the truck, girls? Y'all go get in the truck, okay? Just as things were looking hopeless, off-duty firefighter Gene Grizzle pulled up in his truck. It just seemed like a miracle to me that Gene showed up. I said, Gene, get the oxygen. We need to get some oxygen on this kid. I could see the firemen working on my brother, trying to give him oxygen. What flow do you want? Give, give me full, full flow. I just remember praying that God wouldn't take Graham and that he would be okay. With each passing minute, the chances for Graham to survive became less and less, until finally, a hopeful sign. I noticed the child's eyes fluttering a little bit. See his eyes He's gonna be okay. I told his mother, he's alive, he's gonna be okay. Not knowing that he would be okay, but at that time I knew he was alive. 45 minutes passed before additional help finally weaved its way through the field of debris to reach the injured boy. The ambulances were going all over the county. There were injuries, confirmed fatalities. We put Graham into the ambulance, laid him on the stretcher. He started to cry a little bit and then went back unconscious. And uh, I kissed the baby on the head. And I said, God, this is a small child. Reach down here and touch him. Uh, and if it's your will, let him live. Graham was transported to Northeast Georgia Medical Center in Gainesville, where doctors made a horrifying discovery. They did a CAT scan on Graham to determine the extent of his injuries. And this CAT scan showed a puncture wound to the brain. Graham was immediately rushed to Eggleston Children's Hospital in Atlanta, where doctors were standing by to perform emergency brain surgery. They took him into surgery, but at 5 o'clock, the doctor said they could find no puncture wound to the brain, said he had a fractured skull, and he had been impacted with a blunt object. What kind of game would you play with him? Graham made an amazing recovery and was able to return home in just a few days. When I look at Graham, I just marvel that he's here. He's just a living example of a miracle. If Graham hadn't survived, there would have been a huge hole in our family that nothing could replace. Graham's just like a big ball of sunshine to me. He's just so happy most of the time. He means a lot to me, and I wouldn't trade him in for anything. He's a very energetic little four-year-old boy. He's playful, bubbly, delightful to be around. It's just a joy every time that I see him now. Where's my kiss? Wayne was heaven sent for him to have been where he was at that exact moment when we needed him. He is just a living, breathing <laughs> angel. Wearing a fireman's suit. To fully understand the strength of the tornado that hit their home, you may be interested to know that Summer Roper's team jacket was found nearly 60 miles away. Stay with us for more miracles right after this. Coming up, a phone call brings devastating news to a potential transplant patient. What are we going to do? She said, I'm sorry, this isn't going to happen. The last plane has left Missouri, and there is no way that they're going to wait for the organ. So there's no way for us to get this organ to you. A woman's life hangs in the balance when It's a Miracle returns. Have you ever been at a loss to explain a wondrous event that changed your life in a critical moment, something over which you had no control, where perhaps some other force was at work? Well, that's just what the people in this next story would call a miracle. For Janet Larson, Northwest Flight 1815 was a journey that might mean the difference between life and death. Her sister Deborah had suffered from liver disease for the last 10 years, but now her kidneys were failing. 
She was sick all the time. She spent an average of 10 months every year in the hospital. And when she wasn't in the hospital, she was home in bed. She had no quality of life whatsoever. It's a very heart-rending process to go through to watch someone very close to you fade before your eyes. Janet was flying to New Orleans to donate one of her own kidneys to buy her sister some time. But ultimately, Deborah would need a new liver to survive. Janet planned on using the flight time to educate herself on the transplant operation ahead of her. I Xeroxed uh, everything I could find on kidney anatomy and physiology so that I could study it on the plane and just kind of update myself on, um, on how the kidney functions so that I could ask intelligent questions of the doctors. The flight was full. Only one seat remained empty at takeoff time. It was the seat next to Janet. But at the last minute, a man named Alan Van Meter boarded the aircraft to claim it. Like Janet, Alan was also on his way to see a family member. A tragic accident had left his 25-year-old nephew Michael brain dead and on life support. Alan was going to be with his grieving sister. Michael was alive, but uh, uh, it looked bad. When I boarded the plane, I had pretty well decided I wasn't going to have a conversation with anybody. You know, I was just going to try to work some of this out in my head to get some understanding. Still, Alan couldn't help notice the pictures and medical charts spread out on Janet's lap. Are you a doctor? Um, no. Um, and I told him the story and why I was flying to be with Debbie. And he says, well, I'm going to see my sister too, but for a very different reason. I said, yeah, I'm going to uh, Paducah, Kentucky, because my nephew just accidentally shot himself. And his condition is looking real bad. They, they don't think he's going to live. Because of Michael's hopeless condition, Alan had helped convince his sister to donate the young man's organs. And I said, well, God bless you, sir. I wish there were more people like you because then nobody would have to wait and nobody would have to suffer. And I went back to study in my diagram. But moments later, Alan made an astonishing suggestion. I tapped her on the shoulder and I said, how about Michael's liver? Uh, we use it for your sister, like that. And uh, she, she looked at me like I was a nut. <laughs> I really appreciate the offer, but I don't think they're going to let us do that. It's a whole lot more complicated. And uh, a couple of minutes later, he tapped me on the shoulder again. I had a sense of urgency that I needed to push this. And I said, we need to make some calls and find out uh, what we need to do. After learning that Alan's nephew and Debbie shared the same blood type, um, Janet got through to Memorial Medical Mid-City Campus in New Orleans. He's brain dead, they've got him on life support, and what we want to know is if we can get his nephew's liver from my sister, is that possible? And she said, is he the same blood type? And I said, yes ma'am, I've already checked on that. And she said, yes you can. Just like that. It was so powerful. And I said, Tell me what to do. This is Alan Van Meter, and my nephew is in there. Uh, the nurse instructed them to call Michael's hospital in Springfield, Missouri, and explain the situation. Yes. And we want to uh, we want to donate his liver to a Deborah White. And she said, Mr. Van Meter, it's too late. Uh, they're already unhooking him. There was a big pause, like she'd set the phone down and left. She come back and she said, no, Mr. Van Meter, it's not too late. I just stopped it. That's how close it was. While these two perfect strangers worked together to make a miracle happen 30,000 feet in the air, on the ground, phone calls flew between hospitals. Yes, Dr. Boudreau, you page me. This is a directed donation. Dr. Philip Boudreau was Deborah's physician. So I received a phone call from the organ procurement agency in the Missouri area informing us that we had a liver offer for our patient, Deborah White. And of course I was uh, flabbergasted and pleased, but I thought that the probability of this proceeding any further than an interesting phone call was uh, very slim. With time of the essence, Dr. Boudreau moved into action, sending a transplant surgeon to Springfield while scheduling Deborah's operation in New Orleans. Meanwhile, in the air, Janet placed the most important call of the day to her sister. I was 
very emotional at this point, thinking that, oh my God, this could happen. Oh my God, this could happen. Are you awake? Hey, listen carefully, honey. Don't get too excited, but I think I might have found you a liver. What? I was trying not to be excited. I was trying to just be calm about it because it was an impossibility. I mean, the, the chances of that, I'd have a better chance of winning the lottery. By the time their plane landed in Memphis, Tennessee, Alan and Janet had formed an incredible bond. Thank you so much. God and they bid each other an emotional goodbye. And I said, well, everything's going to be fine. You watch and see. And I watched her and everything. Every few steps, she'd turn and wave again. You know, she was, uh, uh, you know it, was, it was good stuff. For the two sisters, a joyful reunion and a day of waiting began. The whole day was pitted with ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs. I called my um, transplant coordinator and said, okay, tell me I'm crazy, tell me this is not a go, you know. That's really what I expected to hear. And um, she confirmed the fact that I am crazy, but <laughs> that this thing just might work out. Finally, after hours of waiting, the phone rang but it wasn't the call they'd been hoping for. What are we gonna do? She okay. said, I'm sorry, this isn't gonna happen. The last plane has left Missouri and there is no way that they're gonna wait for the organ. So there's no way for us to get this organ to you. My transplant coordinator said, don't give up. And he goes, I know you better than that. And he said, give me 45 minutes. And that was probably the longest 45 minutes of my life. Hello? Another phone call brought the incredible news that during that time, the hospital had managed to charter a what? jet to pick up the liver from Springfield. <laughs> and four hours later, Deborah was being prepped for surgery. I knew there was no turning back. I knew everything was going to go okay. And I was the happiest person in the world. At 11.30 p.m., doctors began the delicate transplant operation. It took less than half the time expected and was a complete success. Even more amazing, Deborah was home in just eight days. But the miracle didn't end there. The liver was such a perfect match that so far, Deborah hasn't needed Janet's kidney. You know, I'm still in recovery, but getting better every day. You know, I was pretty positive before. Uh, I appreciated little things in life. But now, uh, it's so much more intense. Every little moment, every little thing I get excited about, and I'm um, really glad to be here. But even in their great joy, Janet and Deborah will never forget the sacrifice made by Michael Gibson. I mourn Michael's death, but in a way, he lives on. He saved my life. He lives on in me. This uh, miracle, if you will, happened because someone in their moment of tragedy decided to do something for the greater good. How about if we use Michael's liver to help your sister? Oh, you're so sweet. I we feel very strongly that we were given this miracle so that Debbie can use this special story to promote organ donation and to save other people's lives with it. I think potential donors can hold their head really high because they're the heroes walking around. They're gonna save lives. And that's the ultimate gift, it's priceless. If you're at a loss to come up with a rational explanation for the story you just saw, there's always one other possibility. It might have been a miracle. We'll be right back. Still to come, the U.S. Coast Guard joins in the search for a dog washed overboard in the ocean. I just had in my mind that the dog was still swimming out into the sea somewhere, and eventually he would get tired and drown. Honestly, sorry to report we haven't been able to find Coconut Harry. The chances of finding the dog were zero at that point. The amazing saga of a dog lost at sea when It's a Miracle returns. Birthday celebration, a sunny afternoon, a sailing trip out beyond the Florida Keys. It sounds like all the ingredients for a very special day, but add a sudden storm and it becomes a recipe for disaster. Harry, Woo. come on, go get the coconut, go get the coconut. 
April 14, 1996, started out joyfully for Naomi Simonelli. She and her good friend Gerhard Bitterman were going to celebrate her birthday by sailing her boat, the Odyssey, through the beautiful Florida Keys. Naomi was also bringing along her dog, Coconut Harry, named after his favorite game, fetching coconuts. I'd had that dog since a pup, and um, he's just my best friend. Come on, come on, come on, let's go. The weather was perfect for a day at sea. We decided to go out scuba diving, so we put everything on the boat we needed and to head out to us uh, to the channel. The dog had assumed his normal position on the bow, and Gerhardt and I were up on the bridge. Boy, the water's really clean today, down here, compared to the canal. But an hour into their voyage, the sky turned dark and ominous. The wind and the clouds were noticeable. There was going to be a change in the weather. Rather than turn back, they decided to try to outrun the storm. Normally, you can move away from the storms because they move from island to island. But it did catch us very quickly. As the waves began pounding the boat, Naomi grew concerned about Harry. The boat was being tossed all around, and Coconut Harry was going back and forth. That's when I thought it would be a good idea to take Harry and put him inside the cabin. It's pretty treacherous to take him down the gunnel to the boat because it's very narrow and there's not handrails all the way down. Good boy, Harry. Okay, go down. Come on. That's it. Good boy. Good boy. With Harry safe inside the cabin, Naomi returned to the bridge. I'm coming back. The boat was rocking pretty good. Then it did start raining, and the visibility decreased quite a bit. As Gerhard and Naomi steered the Odyssey through the storm, waves crashed over the stern into the cabin door. Anxious to rejoin his mistress, Harry darted through the opening. But he never made it to the bow. Seconds later, Harry was in the water, fighting to catch up to the Odyssey as it sailed away. But the waves were too big and the boat was too fast. Naomi and Gerhard were unaware of what had happened. We went maybe another 40 minutes or so, and then, like squalls do, it just went as quickly as it came. You beat the boy. I'll be right back. So I decided at that point I was going to go downstairs and make a cup of coffee and I noticed that the door was open a little bit. And I didn't see the dog. Harry? Harry? Gerhard! Gerhard! Harry's gone! Gerhard followed Naomi down below. Harry! Harry! But Harry was nowhere to be found. Naomi's worst nightmare had come true. All I thought is, oh my God, that dog has fallen off this boat. I don't know when he fell off the boat. I don't know where he fell off of the boat. And the chances of finding him would be very hard because there were still a lot of waves. So if the dog was swimming, you wouldn't see him because he'd be bobbing up and down in the waves. I could, I could just see him trying to, trying to reach me. And, um... I was just devastated. Key West Coast Guard boom. This is a trawler odyssey. Come back. Naomi immediately radioed the Coast Guard for help. Key West Coast Guard, Key West Coast Guard. This is the odyssey. Vessel odyssey. This is station Key West. And to my surprise, immediately, the Key West Coast Guard came back on the radio. Roger, we have a vessel in route your position. Over. 
and they came. They came and helped look for the dog. That's a lot of see. This is the Coast Guard 4 and 3 and 8, over. Everyone searched tirelessly for the rest of the day. The water was really dirty. You couldn't see a thing. So we went through the whole thing, and there was a couple of boats we, we talked to, and they were looking out, and, uh, but we just couldn't find them. By sunset, the search was abandoned. Honestly, this is the Coast Guard small boat. Sorry to report we haven't been able to find Coconut Harry. The chances of finding uh, the dog were zero at that dark, point. Uh, we're going to have to return to our station and uh, continue our search in the morning. The dramatic conclusion, when it's a miracle, continues. Coming up, a radio talk show host takes on the challenge of trying to find Coconut Harry. You're thinking, boy, you're never going to find that dog. You just kind of picture that dog out there bobbing up and down in the ocean, nothing around it. You just wonder, how the heck can this dog stay up there and tread water forever? During a sudden storm at sea, a dog is swept overboard and left behind as its master's boat sails away. By the time they discover that he's missing, it's too late. The dog could be anywhere in miles and miles of open sea. As day turned to night, they were forced to give up the search. We're going to have to return to our station and uh, continue our search in the morning. So we made the determination to, to go back to my home. In her entire life, Naomi had never felt so low. I just had in my mind that that dog was still swimming out into the sea somewhere, and eventually he would get tired and drown. That was one picture that kept going over and over in my mind, was seeing the dog's paw on the water for the last time, and then his face going in the water. But Naomi's spirits were about to get a lift. Apparently, a number of people had been listening to this story about my dog on the marine radio. So people started calling the home here, giving me encouragement, saying, you know that Coconut Harry's a golden retriever, and they're a pretty special breed of dog. They have webbed feet and chest cavities that allow them to float, and you, you should never give up hope that perhaps your dog's going to make it to shore. And if he makes it to shore, you want to be certain that people know that he's missing. Encouraged by the calls, Naomi printed a lost dog poster with a picture of Harry on it and began papering the neighborhood with them. The ad generated a lot of concern and help from other people that I had never even met. So there were a lot of people pulling for the dog. May I speak with someone in the classified section, please? Yes. She also placed an ad in the local newspaper offering a reward for his return, dead or alive. Let's go back to the phones, Dave. Good morning, you're on the biz band. Meanwhile, a friend of Gerhardt's contacted a popular local radio show, Bizarre Bazaar and Flea Market, and its host, Gene Michaels. I love taking my mom that took her to a whole vacation. She we're more or less uh, the voice of the Keys. <laughs> we're very community minded. You're thinking, boy, you're never going to find that dog. You just kind of picture that dog out there bobbing up and down in the ocean, nothing around it. You just wonder, how the heck can this dog, uh, you know, just stay up there and tread water forever? We've been out there in the boat before in rough seas and, and nobody around, and it's a scary feeling, so I can imagine how this dog was feeling. Even though he felt it was a hopeless situation, Gene continued to remind his listeners to keep an eye out for the dog. We're all like family here. When something happens to someone in the community in the, in the Keys, everybody comes together and, and helps out. As the days passed, Naomi refused to give up hope, and then, she received a disturbing call. I wanted to hear, what, what did the dog look like? And they told me they had seen a dog, a dead dog floating offshore. And it upset me tremendously. Where exactly did you see this dog? 
Naomi didn't want to believe that the dead dog was Harry. But as more days went by, her spirits sunk lower and lower. By the time the weekend rolled around, I had pretty much decided that I was never going to see Harry again. So I started packing up his toys and his food. I, I thought it would be better for me not to have to look at them every day. Unable to face the situation, she relied on Gerhardt to keep her abreast of the news. I was still optimistic. Every day I said, he will come, he will come, we'll, we'll find him. The people down here, they would not stop looking for that dog. Eight days after Harry had fallen into the ocean, Randy Clay landed on a small, uninhabited stretch of land called Key Lois, also known as Monkey Island. Hey, monkey. Hey, boy. The island was used to raise rhesus monkeys for research, and Randy's job was to feed and water them. When I approached the Monkey Island, I noticed that most of the monkeys were up in the tree, and they're usually on the ground, free-ranging, and uh, I knew something was wrong. Suddenly, Coconut Harry miraculously appeared out of the bushes. Dog, no one of the monkeys are up in the trees. I spotted a dog along the shoreline, free ranging back and forth, evidently, it was pretty thirsty. This is the Coconut Harry dog that was lost. I knew whose dog it was immediately, because of all the flyers. Randy had no idea how truly astonishing his discovery was. For Monkey Island was a full five miles from where Coconut Harry had been swept overboard more than a week earlier. It wasn't long before the phone rang at US One Radio. We got a call that Harry had been found out on uh, Monkey Island. We were surprised and very happy too for Naomi and the dog. There you go. I'd call it a miracle, probably. Everybody's Gene be Michaels now. announced the miraculous news over the airwaves, and a short time later, Gerhard picked up Harry at the station and took him home to Naomi, who had no idea that he'd been found. And he said, um, I have something in the car for you. He looked happy, and we had been sad for, for so long. It only took a moment for Naomi to realize why Gerhard was smiling. Face was like uh, like the sun like the sun comes up you know. Oh my sweetie! I was just so happy. I just was like, oh my God! I can't believe this is happening. Harry, where you been? There is a God, and he must he must love me to bring this dog back to me. <laughs> He's all exhausted now. Look it was way. really the best thing that's ever happened in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Harry was home, and everything was perfect. Naomi is certain that Harry's survival in the turbulent sea was nothing less than a miracle. No one really knows how long Harry was in the water, but I know that the conditions were very poor and that the dog was unable to see any land. Harry never gave up. He had swum against the wind and the waves, and just by God's guidance, made it through the water, lived on an island with monkeys, which can be pretty dangerous. Yes, I do believe in miracles. I believe I was privileged to have one. My greatest desire is to really care for him and let him know how much he means to me every day. Yeah, Harry's my hero. He's my hero. And I love him. What a story of determination and survival. Well, we wanted to see how Coconut Harry's been doing with his adventure at sea, and so he joins us now, along with Naomi Simonelli from their home in Summerland Key, Florida. Hello there. Hi, Richard. How are you doing? 
Fine, thank you. And yourself? Just fine. So how's Harry holding up after his ordeal? He's great. He's enjoying retirement. Retirement? I thought dogs were born retired. But if any dog deserves it, it's certainly Harry. He loves being retired. He hangs around the house all day, and we go swimming every day. And um, he's very healthy, thank God. And I'm, I'm just glad I have Harry with me today. Well, we are too. And you mentioned swimming. Does he still like to go out to the boat? He loves to go boating. He's the first one on and the last one off. Well, what if there's a storm? Harry doesn't like storms. <laughs> He gets very um, nervous when the weather changes, and he will immediately run in the bathtub and stay there till the storm passes. He hides in the bathtub? Yes. Smart dog. Yes. Well, he's from Oklahoma. We were trained to go in the bathtub in bad weather. Now, I hear that Harry has reaped some benefits from his story. Would you tell us about that? Well, Harry and I got to be on a, a number of television shows, which was fun for both of us. And the um, SeaWorld people came and took us to SeaWorld, and Harry was given a gold medal for dogged determination. Dogged determination. I guess that just about sums it up. And I want to thank you both for joining us this evening. Thank you, Richard. Bye-bye. We'll be right back. That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night. <laughs>